like to welcome our, uh, our first guests uh, on stage. Um, uh, to your uh, right is uh, Lisanne van uh, Weelde. She's an assistant professor at Utrecht University Communication Science, uh, where she teaches on uh, visual uh, communication. Uh, then uh, Saba Azin, uh, she's the project lead of the Human Security Survey Iraq, a protection of civilians program of PAX, the largest peace organization in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, to my left, uh, Lauren Gold, uh, which is your partner, uh, Saba. Uh, she is an assistant professor in conflict studies and the project leader of the Intimacies of Remote Warfare uh, program. And she's also one of the public engagement fellows of, uh, of Utrecht University. Um, let's start with your uh, uh, project. Um, so together you conducted research on the impact of the Dutch bombing of Havija in uh, Iraq. Um, maybe you can tell us something about how this partnership uh, came about. Yeah, well, actually, it was um, we were drawn together by one of our other key partners, namely, um, I would say, the badass human rights lawyer Lisbeth Sechfeld, mm. who uh, likes to take the Dutch court to um, the Dutch state to court for their um, uh, war cr war uh, interventions. Let's put it at that. I won't call them a war crime. Um, and she brought us all together in a round table to help with one of her cases. And Pax was there, um, Intimacies of Remote Warfare, but also another organization called Air Wars that um, basically counts the bodies of the dead um, after bomb bombardments take place. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. We have such knowledgeable people at the table who are um, trying to understand the impact of remote um, airstrikes on civilians. And from that moment on, um, I decided in collaboration with PAX and Airwolves to keep these round tables going um, to see how we could uh, find each other and, and, and learn from each other's expertise and also um, yeah, have a voice in the public debate on this particular topic. So it was, was that the first time that you experienced this uh, dur during this round table, this idea, oh, there are other partners that I can work together with? Yeah, definitely. Right. And, yeah. and yeah. And I, uh, like most love stories, I think our um, partnership also started um, with frustration and frustration with the Dutch MOD for not doing uh, research, not doing action and not putting uh, their actions where their words are. So we said, OK, you know what? We'll show you how it's done. And, and yeah, that, that's how our, our, our love story started. Yeah, yeah. Ma maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit more, Saba, about uh, the project. What, what was the goal of the project? Um, that's the thing, as in we see, um, well, there was a Dutch airstrike in Havija 2015. Uh, the Dutch uh, government, of course, kept silent on it for <laughs> four and a half years. Um, uh, incidentally, I was in working in Iraq for almost two years, uh, living in Iraq as well. Uh, and I also hadn't heard of the airstrike or Havija, as in I knew about Havija, but never knew the extent of the damage. And I'd visited Havija before, but, but never that, that uh, place. And this is back when it was liberated. Um, and when this uh, sort of opportunity came around, we because we also do a lot of work on civilian harm, and we also feel that, um, you know, when we're talking as researchers, as academics, we also saw, and, and even in the media, they say 70 dead. Uh, there are humans behind that 70 dead. And there's that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more behind that. Um, if the breadwinners died, what happened to the family? If somebody's lost their limb, uh, what happens to the family? The fact that children dropped out because now they have to support their family. You know, there's, there's so many what we call reverberating effects of that one incident mm -hmm. that they describe as 70 people possibly died. Uh, so we, so we, we basically wanted to research that together. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you sort of um, uh, share tasks or divide tasks? Good question. Um, so it was very much a collaborative process in um, finding each other. We also uh, immediately uh, acknowledged that we, neither of our organizations could do this alone um, and that we needed a local organization that had the um, access but also the trust of the local population mm -hmm. who would of course in, you know for these four and a half years hadn't been seen um, yeah. by the Dutch state or uh, other organizations. Al-Khats um, and so then, in a very collaborative way, 
Paxson, the Intimacies of Remote Warfare, came together and, and thought through the research proposal. So, you know, what is our core question? What methods are we going to use? Um, what kind of questions do we want to pose? And then Saba um, really worked very closely with Al Khat to set up the research team in Hawija and roll out the research there. And then it came back again. So it's, it's yeah, a very iterative process. The interviews came back. We had a community engagement learning project with a wonderful group of students, um, interdisciplinary group of students that really helped us analyze um, the data because it kept expanding, didn't it? We, we've now, we have um, 119 uh, individual interviews and 20 uh, key respondent interviews. Yeah, uh, 119, as in it started with, okay, we'll maybe interview 40, we'll get 30 clean ones, that's enough. It, it ended up with 119 people who directly uh, were uh, witnessed the airstrike uh, and, and each interview is about four hours long, so about 25, 30 pages of transcript. Um, and then about 40 key informant interviews uh, and, and multiple focus group discussions with, again, over 100, and over 100 uh, civilians on the ground. Mm. And what, wh what was the result of the research? Mm. Is Bombs, that a report? Bad people good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and did, 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 did you want to write a report? Uh, yeah. So, th so there's a number of outcomes. So we've just finished the report. It's mm -hmm. become a, uh, uh, it's a bit of a beast. Half, I would say, like half a PhD. Uh, <laughs> we wrote in about four months, um, and the launch is on 12th of April um, in in the Netherlands, in the Bali, and it will be in Iraq before that, where we first bring the report back to the people that this report is about. Um, yes, maybe um, we we have some slides as well. And and just so everybody knows, these are these are from uh, um, February, early February. So it's 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 about five weeks old. And if you see the destruction here, six mm. and a half years, this is what it looks like. You'd think it happened yesterday, didn't? Mm. Yeah. Um, so that will be one of the outcomes. But actually, in the meantime, there's been many. Um, we've really engaged uh, as a consortium again um, in public debates about this topic. So we've really put a lot of pressure through, for example, op-eds and um, um, you know, informing pub, uh, parliament mm. to try and increase the transparency levels on um, this particular uh, incident. Um, but also we've engaged, and this was interesting for me as well, so you know, I'm a critical conflict analyst, I would say. Mm. Um, Pax really invited me to say, okay, but we also have to be constructive and we have to think through how things could be improved instead of just um, offering our critique. So we engaged in a year and a half roadmap process with the Ministry of Defense um, to improve their transparency policies. So. This was indeed kept um, uh, denied and then kept secret from the parliament. And I think one of the key objectives was saying, well, we need to maintain democratic control over the wars that are waged in our name. Um, therefore, our parli ne parliament needs to be informed mm -hmm. about civilian casualties. Um, so that was another kind of offshoot. Yeah, so so how, how did that collaboration with the Ministry of, of Defense work? Yeah, so it was a roadmap process of a year and a half, a lot of pre and after negotiations, but in principle, the core of the roadmap was four expert sessions, um, which one was led by the Intimacies of Remote Warfare, um, in which we engage with um, numerous different actors within the military and, and the Ministry of Defense to talk through uh, why it's important to, to uh, pay attention to civilian harm and why the parliament should be informed by it. But Sarah? also the fact that, uh, you know, as, as the Netherlands, we know this is not a one-off war. They're, they'll continue mm. participating in multiple coalitions. Then how can they negotiate a better role in those coalitions, so to speak? As in, of course, we're not behind wars or, or asking them to go drop more bombs. We've seen what, what one bomb could do and can do. Um, but for instance, uh, you know, even in the case of Havija, they kept on saying, yes, but the intelligence was provided to us by the U.S. We did not know, and we just went and and conducted the airstrike. But then how do you get a better um, uh, part in the coalition where you actually see the intelligence files? Mm. You know, it's, it's, it's also going back to things like that. It's going back to the transparency law that they have. Mm. How and when will they declare it to parliament? How soon, considering that the then Minister of Defense knew within two weeks of what had happened? Yeah, I was also wondering about, I mean, we're talking about public engagement and there's an audience. Who, who do you think is your 
audience? Is it the Ministry of, of Defense, so uh, government officials, or is it the uh, sort of the general public that you can reach through in a public opinion? How, how, how do you see that? Well, I think, I think the audiences started with each other. So, like mm. I said, in these round tables, we, we were each other's audience because yeah. we had specific expertise that the other organizations didn't have. Um, so there was a lot of, of uh, co-creation of knowledge, but sharing of knowledge. Then, of course, in this roadmap process, it was the Ministry of Defense. Um, two weeks ago, Paxson Intimacies went to the Parliament. So we informed the Parliament about the roadmap process and its outcomes. And now, in two, in on the 12th of 13th of April, we're launching the report, which will be much more for a general public as well as all the other audiences. I've yeah. just uh, yes. and and for us, it's it's also the Iraqi Iraqi public. Uh, the fact that um, you know, of course, I'm not denying that that Mosul wasn't big; it was a million people over uh, compared to 80,000 who were besieged in Khadija. Um, but the fact that funding continuously goes to Mosul. If you enter there, it's like what I call branding and marketing central, like logo here, logo here, logo here, logo literally in your face all the time. In Havija, especially the city center where this happened, nothing at all. Now you do see a UNDP and, and Dutch flag uh, with nothing behind it. Uh, that's, that's the irony of it all. Um, that could take me another four hours, uh, <laughs> which I don't think we have. Um, so it's also the Iraqi public, the Iraqi government, the fact that you know they have a, a compensation committee. So where is the compensation for the people? Uh, for us, it's also the general public here because again, wars are waged in our name, and they uh, they are paid for by our tax money. Uh, I'm not Dutch. I only came here three and a half years ago. The Dutch people I know are the ones who collected, uh, who managed to with the with the crowdfunding managed to get sixty or eighty thousand euros for Omar's treatment, not the ones who bombed him. So it's also the Dutch public for us. And then because we work so much on civilian harm, uh, it's also internationally we want to show that mm -hmm. uh, one of our aims is that in, in, in the targeting process that coalition is uh, uh, engaged in, they look at what is called uh, the collateral damage estimate and, and how, how many people there are, what is their estimated life. But then what about the infrastructure that's damaged or these reverberating effects? Mm -hmm. so they should also be integrated within that estimate. That's, yeah. that's our overarching aim as well. Yeah, so it's not just uh, the, the bombing, but the, the, the effects that are, you know, are still there. Yeah. Um, uh, Pax is, is, of course, um, explicitly a political organization. I mean, you want to uh, uh, um, influence politics, Lauren. How, how, how is that for you? I mean, you, you you, you're taking a, a strong political stance. Um, how, how, how does that feel as a, as a researcher, as an independent researcher? Well, it, it, it feels really important. Um, mm -hmm. It feels that the knowledge that we're creating um, actually matters um, and and can be used to uh, inform people, to, to create awareness. But also I think the level of detail that we have time to research in um, allows us to pinpoint certain... Uh, yeah, areas that are overlooked or maybe strategically <laughs> ignored by mm -hmm. certain policymakers. And I think it's also really important as academics to realize that you have a certain status and certain um, role to play um, in that we are one, I think, you know, we have quite a lot of space to to bring in that critical analysis mm. um, um, as an individuals as well, which some you know organisations may may be able to do less because they're very much also defined by their you know their their organisational policy about yeah. what you can and can't say, and I found that to be um, yeah really important in those in those discussions. Mm. And did, did you also and the oh, feel, feel supported by the university? For doing that? Yeah, absolutely. By the uh, university, by the team that we work in, because this is definitely not my own uh, mm -hmm. own doing only. Um, Professor Yola Demers is uh, 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 the research lead in the Intimacies of Remote Warfare program, but also these wonderful group of students that, I, yeah, without them we would be nowhere. Um, yeah, so very much supported and you need and by the organisations we work with, and you in these kind of debates, you need that support. It it feels. Yeah, you feel stronger when you've got so feel that somebody's got your back in these kind of yeah. debates because it can get quite uh, quite hairy at times. Mm -hmm. um, uh, do most you, times. <laughs> do, you, do you think you will continue uh, to work together also on other projects, maybe? 
No, uh, we're, we're calling it <laughs> it's quits done. now. It's done. You're Bye. done now. No, the love is over. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> the one night stand. <laughs> exactly. Uh, which, which lasted over two, two years. Now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> two years stand. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think so. Uh, for me, as a typical NGO person, uh, partnerships are also different. So there's one with with uh, w which have a financial, let's say, uh, undertaking or whatever. So I'm uh, quite promiscuous like that. I'm also managing five other partnerships right now. Um, <laughs> but then there are your your society partners, like like Lauren said, that you know if one person's raising their voice, whatever. But when there's you know four or five of us and and, and sort of big weights, uh, not like this, but but big weights in, in terms of names, um, there is that that momentum. And and um, I remember one of my, my my first ever jobs, you know, 23 fresh out of school. Um, we looked at the triangle between uh, policy makers, academics, and and practitioners, and the fact that that triangle is often broken mm. because academics will try policy makers a certain way and then practitioners a certain way, but never together. Mm. I think this is where that triangle comes into like actual fruition. And so even if, if there isn't like a, a, a two year long research, I don't think this partnership is, is over in, in, in any case. Uh, I think we still have a long way to go with the MOD in, in, in how policies are influenced. Um, so yeah, if, 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 yeah, not a, let's say not a, a, a very two year long uh, <laughs> research, but I don't think this partnership is over. It's just the beginning. Good. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's sweet. Um, <laughs> Let, let's talk about time investment for a moment. I think um, we all want to hear how, how much effort did you put into this, Lauren? <laughs> um, lots of wonderful effort into a relationship <laughs> that's been very yeah. fruitful. It's been a lot of time. Yeah, yes. it's been weekly meetings. I think in the end we decided that weekly meetings worked best because it um, uh, kept the balls rolling. Um, I think in the, I think the the writing of the report was also um, yeah, it was a a hairy affair at times. <laughs> Sorry, a hairy affair. At a times. hairy affair at times. <laughs> yeah, because that's also where the institutional time frames come in and 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 expectations and. And I think, again, what lessons learned is to be very clear about expectations beforehand. But at every time, even when it's got hairy and frustrating and, and you know, a lot of over hours, I've always felt that, yes, but without this joint expertise at this table, we couldn't, couldn't have, have done, done it. it. And, no. and that is really enriching. To, and that data that we have, you know, can be used in many different ways. And there's no way I, as, an, as a researcher, could have created that on my own and wouldn't have wanted to. Right. Are there any questions already? Do you want to ask a question? Well, we can also continue. That's fine. Um, yeah, let's let's go to you, uh, Lisanne. Uh, like I said, you're an assistant professor at Utrecht University. Uh, you teach and you research on visual communication uh, and the design of data visualization uh, and the cognitive effects of this design. Um, and when it comes to uh, having partners in public engagement, you have been uh, dating for uh, for a fairly long while. Yeah. Um, for years now, you have been working for companies and organizations one day uh, a week, in addition yeah. to your scholarly work. Yeah. Um, when and why did you start doing this? When and why? Um, well, actually, after I uh, I finished my PhD research, I thought okay, I'm a good researcher, but I can be a better researcher if I connect more to, to society. Um, so from the moment that I became assistant uh, professor, first in Tilburg and then in Utrecht, um, I was always looking for a company where I could, where I could work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so um, um, in the past 10 years, I've been working at four different companies. Um, and... Um, yeah, completely different companies, actually. Um, and it all started out with um, lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, just, just a regular date. Just I a regular must say. date. Yeah, just a regular date. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I started looking for companies that were doing something that I really liked. Um, and then I just reached out to see if I could, uh, could drink coffee. And then um, um, trying to find out what, um, how they feel about ac academics, how they feel about um, having a researcher on board. Um, and um, 
I and must how, say how, that how did they feel about having a researcher well, on board? <laughs> well, I must say that most of the of the people that I that I talked to uh, really wanted to have a, really still want to have a researcher or academic on board. Um, mm. They are really looking for for information for knowledge that they that they can use and. Um, there are not many academics that also work um, in what I call the real world, but now I'm, mm. I must say I'm not really sure what the real world is but anymore, but um, yeah, they really like it, yeah. Can you name a few of the, the, the partners that you've been with? Yeah, so I started out um, um, at a startup doing something with persuasive communication, then I started working um, at a big marketing company, Newcraft, then I started working at a big law firm. Um, the name I don't like to mention right now, no, Houthoff. Uh, it's been in the news quite often, yes, yes. Um, and now I'm working at Deloitte uh, for almost two years. Um, yeah, so what I do is I, I have a sort of advisory role uh, right now at Deloitte and um, um, I always work one or two days um, um, at the company, mm -hmm. yeah. And is is this the kind of research re research that you do for <laughs> them? Yeah. No, this is not for them. This okay. is not for them. No. So this is a uh, this is an example of uh, of the materials that we research. So if you see amongst all these icons, there is the Corona icons, um, and um, yes, this was a collaboration with the Tao Uni, and we investigated how uh, people understand these kind of icons. Um, and um, especially whether low literate people understand these kind of icons. Turns out um, they don't, uh, neither do we. So, <laughs> um, but this, this type of research really started from the network that I, that I gained. So um, yes, so it, it's really a sort of starting, um, it ignites um, uh, the, the type of research that I do, hmm. yeah. Yeah, let, let's talk a little bit more about why you want to do this. Because what what does it bring you as a researcher? What does it bring me? Um, so when you when you perform research and you write articles about it, um, you don't see people's faces when they read your paper, right? I mean, um, at conferences, of course, you have discussions and you talk about your research, um, but you don't really see what people actually do with it. Um, and what I like is is working at a company where I talk about research all the time. Um, I must say that sometimes they get really sick of me, I guess. <laughs> um, and I see what they can do with it. I see what they find interesting, um, and I see how it is used in um, in the design of icons, for instance. Um, and that makes me a better researcher, um, I guess. Um, and it makes it more fun. Mm -hmm. um, so I see what my research brings, brings, but I also see what kind of questions there are um, at those companies, um, and I can um, sort of uh, bring that those questions in my research. And what what, what do your your peers, your scholar peers, think about what you do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. People from from within your discipline are they like, oh, that's that's interesting? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. I'm going to work no, no, for no. One I, day I, I, I guess I guess they like it. I, I don't think that they find me. Um, um, well, they do find me a different kind of researcher as compared to them. Yes. Yeah. So I'm yeah I'm 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 a bit weird in that sense. <laughs> um, but they they I guess they do see what it brings me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I talked to Lauren about uh, independence as yeah. a researcher, and you you talked about how to off and I mean I yeah. don't want to put you on the spot. Oh, uh, you can. But but you did some assignments for uh, the Russian Federation <laughs> for uh, uh, Houthoff. Yeah, well, what does that do to your position as a, as a, as a researcher as an as an independent researcher? Yes, yes. Well, sometimes. Um it, it, yeah, sometimes it it brings questions <laughs> to your mind. You're thinking, okay, what am I doing? Mm -hmm. um, so yes, sometimes it's re it's really hard. But when I'm working at the company, I'm really a member of the company. I'm just working there, um, and um, so I try to. I really have two worlds that I try to connect um, as often as possible. But sometimes it is just what it is, and um, um, they they also pay my salary. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's it's sometimes it's difficult. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah. especially this one. <laughs> it's a bit painful. <laughs> um, we, we haven't talked about teaching yet. Um, you're, you, you're both teachers, you, you as well, uh, Lauren. How, how does working for a company uh, or, or working with a partner on research like uh, that affect your teaching? Maybe you first, yeah, Lisa. Yeah. Um, I think so it, I think it really makes me a better teacher. Um, um, most of the students are not going into the academic world. <laughs> they're actually going to work at the companies where I also worked. So I know what they are going to do. I know where they are, where they're going to end up. Mm. Um, and um, I feel that I can prep them better for what's coming. Yeah. Um, and um, I also do that by constantly bringing in cases um, from my other job. So uh, all, yeah, all the assignments, all the type of uh, research projects that they do are always connected to, uh, to the companies that I work with. And then you use the input of the students at work now. Just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that's, um, yeah, and I bring students to those companies for internships. Hmm. Um, so I really try to find that connection. And hmm. I think I'm a better teacher based on that. But they haven't told me. <laughs> <laughs> How's that for you, Lauren? Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I've been engaging in these community engagement and learn, learn and get, whoop, community engagement learning projects. Mm -hmm. um, that are the the centre of such a project is to work with a societal partner um, and basically see what questions there are amongst the uh, your societal partner that students can work on. So, in in our case, we had um, a wonderful group of students, and they did it alongside the research that was being rolled out in, in Hawija, an online um, investigation of how people responded to the bombardment and the secondary explosion and, and the, the deaths that took place online. So it was very complimentary. But in the end, um, these students were yeah just so talented, talented and eager to participate in the rest of the um, research as well that they became kind of core to, to the analysis of the data mm. that was coming back from Hawija. So I think this is a, an example. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for the students because it, it, it allows them to to interact um, with a, a organization such as PAX to really learn how they work. And, and But, you know, they also sat in with the roadmap process. So they were, because everything was online, they could be, you know, silent participants and, and basically witness how these negotiations took place with the Ministry of Defense, which for them was a really enriching um, experience. Yes, and as a former student, as in that's how I ended up with Box. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. it, works. it works. <laughs> yes, we, we have time for, for uh, questions. I mean, we're, we're talking about partner and stakeholder engagement. So if you have any questions about that or particular questions to Lauren, yes, I'm just going to get the mic. If you can share the mic. Yes. Thank you for your inspiring. Oh, you want to hold that? Yes, I will. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> Thank you for your inspiring stories. Um, I was wondering, Lisanna, you said that your 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 colleagues see you as a different kind of scholar. Is it different in a good way, or different in a more negative way? Could you say something about that? Um, I think it might be in a, in a negative way that I'm not always available. Um, so I have very strict division between my university days and my company days. That's the only way this is possible, I think, um, which results in the fact that I'm not always there. Um, and I respond maybe a little bit later uh, to emails or phone calls as compared to other colleagues. Um, so that, that might be the negative part. But on the other end, I think um, um, they find it interesting. Um, and I know, because some of my colleagues um, also ask me, how am I doing this? Um, um, so they 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 are interested in um, in this kind of uh, this kind of connection. Um, so I hope some of them will start doing it. But hey, we'll oh. see. Yeah, I had a question for Saba actually about this very intriguing triangle you talked about mm -hmm. about the relationship between researchers, practitioners, and policymakers, and that it can break at various points. Um, so it'd be interested to hear more about that and also sort of what role academics can play when there are tensions between policymakers and, and practitioners getting caught in the middle of that or whether there are differences in sort of how, how um, 
scholars and scientists can relate to practitioners as opposed to policy, whether well, that's sort of a different register in which you're operating? No, there definitely are differences. Um, as in, for instance, for us, it's like, do it, do it, do it, do it. And I also come from a humanitarian background, so you know, if you're responding to emergencies, it's like, um, and, and of course, when you're doing academic research, it can take time, and it should take time, because you know, you are very rigorous, it's not quick and dirty. Um, but at the same time, when you have that research backing up a claim you're making, the policy makers cannot look left and right and shy away from it, as in they will shy away and avoid it, that we've seen that happen. But the fact of the matter is that when we're talking to, let's say, the public, there is like a whole plethora of, of data behind it, and we're only sharing probably 10% of it all, I think uh, mo most of the people can understand here. Um, and that really you know, puts the weight behind the claims that we're making jointly. And when it breaks, whether it's between uh, ac academics or, or, or practitioners, um, that's, that's also not very good because, yeah, quick and dirty can work when you're responding to an emergency and, and getting out you know, food or blankets or whatever to people. But when it comes to researching stuff like that, quick and dirty does not work. Uh, or it won't work as nicely. It, it'll be uh, result in four newspaper articles, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I would say to add to that, that's a lot of time was also invested in maintaining our own relationships. So we have our relationship with, in this case, the MOD, for example, but make uh, the negotiations amongst ourselves to put forward a c common um, a ground and, and, and um, yeah, recommendation. That takes a, a lot of time, but yeah, the impact is, is indeed much larger. And also, as in the hours spent just to sort of break it down into a language that we they will understand because they also don't want to as in we, <laughs> we also like to finger point and play our activist role, but, but then they will completely shut down. So how do we get through to them? And, and I think that was the most frustrating, <laughs> frustrating part for, for, all of, for yeah, both our organizations combined. It also yeah. matters the, the different language that you're using. Wait, Joel, exactly. I'm just gonna. I can imagine there's also a different language that you need to choose. Well, f you can probably say something about that as well. Uh, when speaking to practitioners, then speaking to, and so, does that, does that complicate what public engagement means then? Because in a certain sense, it may operate in two different modes, and so you can't have one message that goes to everybody. Exactly, and that's why um, I think, which is why when we spent hours and hours, uh, probably more time writing the report than, than actually doing the research, because we then had to constantly go back and say, okay, what is the audience? Who are we trying to influence? And when it comes to recommendations, if we use this term, for instance, if we use something like individual compensation that the MOD is like, uh, mm -hmm. then they will shut down and not engage. So what is a word we can use which also satisfies us, although individual compensation is like high up for us, but then how do we get across to it? And then how, fine, it's, it's, it's like a beast of a report, 120 pages, which, which was also chopped down to half of what we originally had. Um, so how can we then use different, or, or create different products out of it, even if it's two or three pages, and, and go to different audiences. Do you want to comment on that as well, Isona? Um, yeah, well, uh, for those companies, it always holds that time's money, of course. So I can't be spending too much time on explaining all those research. Um, um, so they really just want to hear, OK, what's in it for us? What should, should or shouldn't we do? Um, and making that translation from all the scientific knowledge that we have to the more practical, um, uh, the more practical way of, of explaining it. Yeah, I love that. That's mm -hmm. that's yeah. So making it um, accessible for for more than just us academics. Are there any more questions or remarks about partners and finding a partner? Yes, I have a question for Lizana. Um, you mentioned that. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't really yeah, see I'm it. sorry. <laughs> I'm just gonna like that. All right, that's um, better. You mentioned that when you're working for the company, you take on a different position than when you're doing research. But I is imagine that, especially in the case you mentioned, it's not always clear to the audience that you take on different roles sometimes. Do, so, uh, in your own communication, do you take measures to um, to make sure that you're uh, either speaking from one position or yeah. the other? to make yeah, that yeah. clear and how do you do that yeah, yeah yeah so i'm i'm very clear in that sense so um also when i'm when i'm writing blogs or or i'm publishing online it's always from either academic lisana or deloitte lisana because um yeah there is really a distinction between that 
And sometimes I, I use both affiliations, um, but, I, but I, every time I publish something, I think about it. Yeah, yeah. So it is, yeah, it is really two hats. <laughs>